and welcome to Time to Talk with Hannah Spearman. Um, Hannah owns Rebel Ritzy Gun Dogs and also Rebel Ritzy Photography and we've just had a lovely coffee chatting about all things gun dogs, about gun dog photography, um, gun dog training and a lot about her passion for the visual breed. So grab yourself a cup of coffee, settle back and enjoy. Take care. Bye-bye. Hi folks, I'm here with the lovely Hannah Spearman of Rebel Ritzy Gun Dogs and we're going to talk all things gun dog. So I, Hannah, I met you a few years ago through the Accredited Pet Gun Dog Instructor Scheme and that was the first time I'd really come across you as a person, but I'd seen your photos and so as well as Rebel Ritzy Gun Dogs, uh, you also do the photography and that's where I want to start because that's kind of where you started as well. So why why photography? How did you get into it? Is it something you started really young or? My background is design um, and I've actually got a degree um, in textiles and I went to the Royal College and did textiles and design and um, got into photography and then over the years kind of left it behind but then also had an interest in the dogs and the two of them ended up merging and I think trying to it's getting inside that world so when you're training you're looking at a dog and understanding what's going to happen and I think with the photography it's looking inside that world with the dog and watching the dog for me and trying to predict what it's going to do and almost bring to life the dog in that moment uh -huh. um yeah and it and it's a um it's a little world that I disappear into which I enjoy, where it's just that moment with you and the dog. Uh -huh. um, I do do some horses as well and other bits, but the dogs, I think, is my main focus. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's almost time away in your head, and it's just you and that animal, and I just really enjoy it. Because I, I did a, a, a dog photography course, the one I see a course, it was like three hours with Nick Ridley, with my, I've got a little Canon G11. And everybody else on the course had these massive, great big lenses, you know. And we had to take a photo of the dogs as we were running past the post. Where it, took me, <laughs> it took me most of the time to actually catch the dog in the photo. I would like catch Angus's tail as he was running past, you know. Um, did you, do you find it, because I, I know when you were doing the instructor course with me, you were so interested in the mechanics of movement and that mean physiology and all that side of, of learning about dogs. And do you find um, just having that deeper insight on how dogs move and, and working your dogs as well gives you the edge in photography because you kind of, you can preempt what they're going to do almost? I think it, it does help because I understand the dog. Um, and you're right, it's getting that movement or what they're going to do. Uh, and it is absorbing yourself in there with them. Um, I think it does help. Yeah, because it's not, I'm just a photographer or a dog. It's the two things that I'm interested in bringing them together. Um, yeah, and it's looking for, I think when I take a photo, I want to take you in there with me. Uh -huh. It's in that journey. It's capturing that, as I always said to you, isn't it? A moment in time. It's a visual, it's capturing that moment and being able to then share it with someone else and someone else see it and understand it. Or even if it's a dog's eyes or an expression or something about that dog that you feel. So often I'll watch a dog for a little bit before I photograph if I can. Uh -huh. So that you start to get in the world with it. Yeah. I mean, your photos are stunning. And your water shots are great. Well, I mean, all of your photos are great. I don't think I've ever seen a bad photo that you've taken. But then I know from working with Nick Ridley as well, it's changed now all digital stuff. So you... You, you've got it um, working in your favour at the minute rather than having to develop all of the photos. And how did yeah. you find the switch over to digital rather than? I think that makes it a lot easier. Um, but if you're not careful, it can make you lazy as well because you haven't got to have the film and go and, you know, and you can click, click, so it frees you up. Um, I think also going to the Royal College as well 
my training there, which probably goes through to my dog training and photography and everything I do, although I still am not directly in that world, um, you had to really look at things and understand things and be you were pushed to um, discuss why you did things, understand things, look further into things, go right in depth into um, things you're looking at and really understand them. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, the level of work you had to do, um, second best wasn't good enough. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so you're not competitive at all. <laughs> You had to. I think I there, was, there was only 10 of us on the course. Um, you know, it's a two-year master's. I think it's the only college that does that. Mm -hmm. um, it's very specific, so y y it pushes you. Were you um, given subjects that you had to? Because I did, because I did art with the essay, and we had, we had specific um, topics that we had to do drawings on. Did, was that the same with... Uh, when you did photography or textiles at college, you had to have specific projects. You couldn't say, right, I'm going to go off and do this. Were, were the like specific subjects you had to do? Initially, you had specific subjects. And then, I'm trying to remember, Les, because it's a long time ago now. Then you'd go off and do your own projects and specialise. Um, I ended up specialising. I got really into digital printing. Uh -huh. And we had a big printer then. I mean, that was at the start of digital printing. So we were lucky because we had those facilities. So then I'll be playing with what I could put through the printer, what I could do. Um, so I went down that side of it back then. Mm -hmm. um, it was quite difficult then because it wasn't so widely used. Um, it's at times changed, um, obviously computers and things. So at the beginning there, I had an interest in it. And then actually I went off, um, we ended up doing renovations on houses and other things and interiors and then, journeys take you isn't it and then come back to the photography later on um the, i don't think the creative side ever leaves you mm. so whatever you're doing whether it's a house photography textile something it, it stays with you it's just you see it in different things i think i think you're right when you become a master it's something it becomes such a part of your way of life and, and you um so, I mean, you know, I'm, I I started with a, as a kinesiologist or a project manager before that, but then kinesiologist. So I look tend to look at everything from a kinesiology perspective. So I'm always looking at people's posture, you know. So if I'm driving and I see somebody walking tilted, then I'll go, oh my goodness, their back's bad, back's bad. Or when I'm marking homework and I'm looking at videos, I can see, I'm, I'm looking to see if the dogs are fit and healthy. If, if there's any misalignment going on and same with the people if they're walking strange and so your eyes become um ingrained with with the mastery that you've got through you know and so i always look at things through a kinesiologist's eyes uh, and then a behaviorist's eyes so when i look at a dog i don't see a fluffy lovely dog i see a social predator that's a behaviour. So I suppose it's a, is it the same for you from a photography perspective? You're always you've always got your eye in and seeing how you could photograph stuff or not. Yeah, I think you're always looking at um, colour. Colour is really important. Colour is very an emotional thing. Um, colour to me is quite it's an emotion. Um, it's striking an emotion with someone else as well. So I think yes, I'm always looking at things. Even when I used to dress the kids, I'd be looking at colours the poor things is that everything yeah is that way I'm looking isn't it at the dogs visually what their faces look like what their colours are like um things around me I'm always without realising capturing things in my eye which is the way I'd look at things mm -hmm. yeah I know after working with Nick I would be out and with the dogs and instead of looking at oh that would make a really nice retrieve I go oh that would make a nice photo oh, that's a good place for a, for a photo rather than that's a good place for a retrieve so I mean, I, I know your mind just never stops. It's constantly looking for stuff. Do, yeah. do, um, for colours, talking about colours, do you have a preferred colour of dog to photograph? Black's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I keep getting told that, so I've got black dogs. It'll make everybody's life difficult. <laughs> have you got you a get colour? Like dogs together or anything? Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, lighter, and it's the same with uh, 
dogs, isn't it? Reading faces, as you know, with a dark face, it's harder for dogs to read. There's less definition. Uh -huh. um, so dogs with a bit of hair or different colours in the face or some sort of, that I'm doing it now, some sort of... Uh, Just hands. <laughs> Yeah, uh, definition or something is easier to capture. A black dog looks fantastic when you get it right, but of course it, it's harder to capture it against the background or um, bring to life areas. Um, and the face is important. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, dog, black dogs are more prone to being attacked because the dogs can't read their faces. Uh, probably because it's the play of the light on it, isn't it? Yeah. So what about white dogs? Do you have the same problem with white dogs or not so much? You don't see so many white dogs, do you? Um, not in the gun dog world? No, you don't. No. Um, no, or they tend to be more hairy like a spaniel, have some definition that bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't see many, do you? Not really. No. Um, and then, no. and then, if you see the white labs or the white goldies, they've always got the, um, they've always got that lovely change of texture and ever yeah. such change in in uh, shade or tone or whatever the word is, you know, over the shoulders and around the triceps and stuff. You do get that little change in colour and a little yeah. change in the texture of the fur as well, I suppose, which gives definition. Yeah, whereas I think with a black dog, you've got to be careful you don't end up with a blob. <laughs> a blob with white teeth, huh? <laughs> yeah, I've had a few. I've got a few photos like that of my dogs, actually. And if you go into the room and you try and take a photo of them on the bed, forget it, because I've got dog beds. <laughs> it's just like a, a little shadow in the corner with white teeth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Two black blobs. <laughs> Two black blobs on a black bed. <laughs> Very bad planning on my part. Uh, uh, so, um, I do. I've got. I've got a lot to ask you because I find the stuff that you do really interesting. One of the things I do have to ask you is why visualize. Why? Why visualize when you've got all of these, <laughs> <laughs> when you've got all of these lovely Labradors to choose from? Why visualize? Why H? Actually, go back one. Why HPRs? I don't think it was originally, it was HPR. I, the Vishla just, I read and read a lot about them. And um, I, I, I thought I wanted one. And then I went to see them and I just went, oh, wow. And I, I don't know why they uh, visually, they please me. Uh -huh. Visual oh. story. There, yeah. Um, I find as companions... They have a depth that I really enjoy. Um, their relationship with me that I think you can't say a dog's almost human, but I find them quite human like at home. Um, they're good fun. You can do training, gun dog stuff. You've got the HPR stuff. So then if you get into the pointing as well as the retrieving, the hunting, um, I just, you can do other things. They're just, I, they're just a good fun dog and but also I like them very much as a companion and visually they're pleasing to my eye which I suppose is important as well you d you've got to find your your own dog attractive haven't you yeah absolutely I and if you don't find your dog attractive then you're not going to train it you're not going to want to be mm. fit mm. So it's the whole the whole thing a dog you've got to get that rush of love when you look at a dog uh, otherwise you're not going to be, want to be with it yeah, and obviously for me, they tick the box, whatever it is, isn't it? It's probably the hair colour. <laughs> well, I was going to say, when you see you um, with the visualise, you, you, you know, your hair, the colour of your hair is like an amazing colour, especially when the light catches it. And then you've got the dogs as well, and it's almost like <laughs> you, you, chose, you chose the colour of the dog to go with your hair. And I know when I had Angus, because he was very blonde, People would go, oh God, blonde on blonde, you know, go and, go and flounce over there, blondies. Um, and it's, it's similar with you, you know, your hair colour and your dog colour. And especially in the autumn, I've seen photos of you and like the Shooter King Camo stuff with your dogs in the <laughs> autumn. And it's just, it's stunning. It's, you know, it's, it looks but great. It, whether it's, it's, blue it's not something that I 
consciously chose because of that. But I do wonder if there's um, an attraction or the colour. But it's a rich colour, isn't it? It's funny because I said to you about the photography, the rich colour. But that's not only why I choose a dog, is it? Because there's lots of dogs that are that colour. Um, the smooth hair as well. I'm actually allergic to dogs. Uh-huh. Okay. So for me, they're a very easy dog to have in the house because anything that's hairy dries because we've got spaniels as well. They drive me up the wall. Um, I get really uh, itchy nose, runny eyes, um, skin irritations, all sorts. So um, for me, as a dog in the house initially as well, that was a good choice. Um, uh-huh. And I wanted to, I suppose with the, the visuals as well, there's, there's the showing side, which I've really, I mean, I've done a little bit, but I've not got that into, um, but... Obviously, a dog wants to be straight physically, uh-huh. legs, to, um, and and it was the working side, I suppose, with them. Um, the HPRs, I think, the pointing side and the hunt side is um, it gives you a buzz in a different way. Um, yeah, I just I just love them. You can tell I do. They get right oh, inside my. Great. Yeah, I think you should come alive when you're talking about your own breed. You know, when you, you talk about your breed of choice, you should come alive. Otherwise, why have you got that breed, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah, and I think I'll always have one. I think they've got right inside me. Um, they're naughty. They're cheeky. They're not always easy, but they are easy. <laughs> okay, I said somebody who trains them. but um, and, and, Not everyone's cup of tea. Well, I was going to say, because I've trained uh, visually, I've not, never had one. No, well, actually, <laughs> I can't imagine me having myself having a Vishla. Although I am quite um, fond of the Spinonis, you know, they've just, if I went for a HPR, it would be in a Spinoni, I'm afraid. But, um, oh God, what was, what was I going to say? Yeah, so I've trained quite a few Vishla uh, in my classes and one to ones. And I'm probably going to get hissed at now. <laughs> I'm quite prima donna ish. Especially the bitches, they're quite, um, it's almost like you have to make it their idea before they'll want to do anything. Whereas I find the wirehead boys especially are much uh, more biddable. You know, they're like, oh yeah, okay, I'll do it if you want me to. Whereas the, the, the um, smooth-coated bitches can be quite, oh, I'm not putting that in my mouth, you're kidding, aren't you? Phew, why on earth would I want to do that for you? And so I find that element of the visualist do you find that or not so much or is I quite the like ones them. i've worked with <laughs> um they can be you're absolutely right i quite like that though i quite like a challenge um it's not one plus one equals two <laughs> um you can't go out and maybe do i don't know like a labrador go right i'm gonna do this today Da-da-da-da-da-da. it doesn't work like that necessarily i think the lines are important um I think where you've got the hunt aspect as well, and you're right. Um, I remember Uma, my old one, no matter how much I, hard I trained, she wasn't really that into retrieving. And after the third one, she'd go, yep, yeah, right, I've done that. Thanks very much. Go and do it yourself, you idiot. Yes. Yeah, they are like that. So how did um, you find switching from Spaniels to HPLs? Because you've got a Spaniel. So how did you find uh, switching from those and also the approach you had on training them as well because you, you know for me I do retrieve then hunt then point I mean the point you can't really tra- I don't think you can train I think it's either in there and you develop the point or it's not in there and you struggle but I would always go retrieving and then hunting and then kind of help the owner develop the point but I'm not a HPR trainer I hold my hands up and say I I'm you want to train HPR go to a HPR specialist uh, I, I think I mean, you get variety in spaniels, HPLs, and labs, don't you? With all the lines, so first of all, it's getting your lines right with what you want. Uh-huh. I think um, a spaniel, particularly Marley, I was given um, as part of my work on the shoot where I was, um, which I was incredibly lucky because she's an awesome dog. Um, but Marley, you could do it forty-eight times just keep going because that's all she wants to do although she'll hunt she's a very biddable little dog she wants to work with me but when it comes to retrieving you could go all day long um I think mine do retrieve like Nushi and um they love it but there's a certain point 
they're, they're different. They're bred for slightly different purposes, aren't they? The HPRs for big ground going out, not doing multiple sitting on the plate type shooting, mm -hmm. although you can use them for different things. Originally, they were designed for a different job to the Spaniel. Um, and the Labrador, I think it's important to look in the history of the dog you've got and understand where it comes from and what they were used for originally and then what you're doing with them and how that works. Does that yeah. Make um, yeah, it makes perfect sense because the HPRs generally are European breeds. Because um, I think, uh, if my memory serves me right, the first lot of HPRs I came over was the German Shorehead Pointer after the Second World War, which is when they became really popular. Um, the the soldiers saw them working. I think that they were working for the police or the armed forces, and they were really popular uh, after the Second World War. And that's really when the HPRs made a big break in the British market. Before then, it was very much the British shoot. So you had the labs or the, the retrieving group doing the retrieving, the hunting group doing the hunting, and then we used the set as my point as rather than the HBRs. But as they've become more popular, they're, they're more versatile, aren't they? Allegedly. I think they really... Allegedly. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so I've been told. So I've well... been told. <laughs> Uh, well, I suppose mine, I'd say I've got a group, I've got a couple of groups of different dogs. I've got uh, my old Rizzer, um yeah, he's a picking up dog and she's awesome. Uh -huh. uh, and then I've got, we've got ones that take rough shooting and do different things with, um, they go and do working tests or, <sighs> they are versatile. I think they've become a lot more popular and there's a lot of breeds within the HPRs and there's different breeds coming up in still as well. Mm. Um, I suppose the point is in cities you don't see as much now. I think the ground as well, like where I live in Kent, we haven't got that much space. I think mm. as you go up the country, up north and things, there's more space for them, isn't there? Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know so much about the pointers and setters, but I think some of the setters are getting more on the endangered side, aren't they? Where they're, um, I believe so, yeah. Um, and but, people on right. the, 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 I think um, you're either a setter and a pointer person or you're a HPR person, really. Yeah. I think, um, but then you, you know, you've got the lab people and the, the Goldie people and we all like our own breeds, but I think you're right. There's more land up here for the setters up, up here as in Scotland. Uh, you know, there's a lot more land for the setters and pointers and there's all the grouse miles up north as well, you know, around yeah. Yorkshire and um, the borders. And I think there are some HPR people that are into the setters and pointers as well. Um, and then you've got the ones that fly the hawks as well with them. Oh, they're um, amazing. Yeah, and I don't know much about that side, but it's a whole other thing. Yeah, it's fascinating. But it's that person going out and hunting and working with your dog, isn't it? Yeah. Um, which, I, and I suppose the hunt, like going up, finding it, the dog finding it, holding it, there, there's that whole, um, it, it's an experience, it, it is quite a special thing I think. It's very uh, primal isn't it, to go out yes. with a dog and a gun yeah. and let your dog yeah. find the game and you shoot it and then take yeah. it and put it on the table for your family, I think it's an awesome thing to do, said she who's never um, crowned a peasant. <laughs> I got mine. Uh, I wait until <laughs> this is a big admission. I wait until the um, the game dealer comes, collects the birds, and then I get mine up and ready. I'm not into. <laughs> oh, I can't do things yeah. like that. I can dispatch, but that's you, you know. Let me. Yeah, I'll I'll dispatch them, and somebody else give me them ready for the oven. Brings it back in cling film. <laughs> <laughs> Bring a black film for him ready to go strip me of him. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, good deal. Good deal. So um in relation to your dogs, now you brought a dog in from Hungary, didn't you? Actually, yeah. go back a bit. You went off to Hungary uh with the British team a couple of yeah. years ago. When was that? Was that it was two thousand four on. years ago? Three no, years. It was two thousand twenty nine. Two thousand eighteen. Okay. So I went out, so the Europa Cup, where all the visuals go and compete, 
together. So that was in Hungary. So that was fun. So I went out with the British team. Um, I'm a brand ambassador for Shoot King Clothing. Uh-huh. They sponsored um, the British team with clothing, which was fantastic. And then I went out as the photographer um, to photograph them and be with them. And that was great to go and see all the dogs. So many visualists, of course. Wow, and yeah, visual of heaven. And support the team as well and promote them. And um, also Shooter King, which is great um, because obviously I'm very fond of them as a company. Um, so I did that. My my interest in Hungary goes back to Uma, my old dog. Um, her dad was a Hungarian bred in Hungary and uh-huh. brought over, and his owner was Hungarian, Ancha. And so I tracked Ancha down because I'm a pain in the backside and I get obsessive about things. So I tracked uh-huh. her down and said I wanted to meet her and Uma's dad and then started watching her with this dog and thought, oh, that's different. <laughs> That's different to how we are in England and how she was with the dog and what the dog was like. And I, I got more and more interested in Hungary and the dogs out there. And I suppose that's a few years ago. So then you could still get little bits on the internet. So I used to watch a lot and trawl through stuff and try and watch some abroad. And also I used to go and see Ancha and we became friends, which was lovely. She's now moved back to Hungary. So my interest in that side was with her. Uh-huh. Um, and then last year, um, I brought back, I was told about a dog, Nushi, mm-hmm. and it was a flip of the coin moment. Shouldn't be doing this, but anyway, we got her, and um, she's been an awesome, she's a very, very special dog. Um, and I had an awesome, I did working tests with her last year. Uh-huh. I only had her a couple of months when I started, and she's only a baby, I think she was 10 months, and I just had a great year with her um she's special because why is she special i said to the kids last night she's got heart and she's got brain um and she wants to do it she has so much drive and passion but she's connected with you as well Uh and she looks to do it and she you say to not i say jump 12 25 foot but you go 25 foot and she'll go i'll do 30 she's just got that but I think I was talking about this with the kids last night I think you've got your breeding and your lines but like some people or animals it's more than the sum of its parts and you don't know why it's just some things come together and make something more uh-huh je ne sais quoi uh, is the same yeah I don't it's, isn't it? it's like just, wow and yeah. and with me for some reason we just bonded like that it was obviously you've got to have your personalities have got to work together. There's got to be something together, isn't there, as well? And we obviously clicked. Um, yeah. It's definitely so. got to be chemistry there. I mean, when you when when you take the lead of a dog um, and you're looking for a dog of your own, I mean, like, I look at Spud, I would never have, never have got a Spaniel. <laughs> and he was a bit of an accident. And I went along to see him and he looked at me and I looked at him and I says, right, you're coming home. And... I I had no intention of getting a spaniel, none, and and you just you have that little something that little spark between you, don't you? Yeah, and I don't know right. why or how, and also taking on a slightly older dog is different, isn't it? Um, to having I've had ones of similar age before, um, so I've had older come in, and I've had puppies. Uh-huh. Obviously, from a puppy you <coughs> can shape them through. Mm-hmm. But Nushi, I don't know, Nushi's just that. You know Nushi, oh, she's got, she's grabbed me completely. I'm completely in love. Um, and she's, her, talking about hunts and retrieving, her drive for both. She's She just wants to do both. And she just wants to, she looks, all, at the moment she's got a cut pad and she'll be going around, she's looking for, to do stuff with me. She wants that engagement of going out to do stuff. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, she was, and hopefully next year, because this year is going to be a funny year, then I'll raise some. Um, yeah. So she was 10 months when you brought her over, did you say? Yeah, I think she was 10 months, yeah. Because I can remember you bringing her over, and, and the training was very different, wasn't it? The, the, the way they bring a young dog on is very different, how we bring young dogs on, just 
the whole culture is different and what they're using the dogs for is different. How did you find, because she was, she was taught in Hungarian as well, wasn't she? So you had to not only start from scratch and retrain her the way you train dogs, but you also had to make, like, start training her in English and, and doing that crossover between the two languages. How did you find out? I'm really intrigued. I've, I've got a bilingual dog. <laughs> <laughs> And I think my Hungarian, um, I'm very lucky because now she's owner, um, we still write to each other every week. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I have a lot of contact with him. And when she came, I thought, because in theory, we shouldn't be chatting to our dogs all the time. So there's only so many words. You actually need to know. <laughs> uh -huh. Think about it. What? Sit down, come. Yeah, yeah there's not no. <laughs> them. Um, and so I watched videos of him training her mm -hmm. and then he wrote the words and played them so said them and then I would play them back. I think now if my Hungarian friends like Peter or anyone listens I don't quite sound like I'm saying proper Hungarian. I'm sure it's formed into Hannah's own Hungarian or her <laughs> new <Nishi> language. <laughs> it, but I, in theory, I, I wanted to learn the basics when she came, so it was easy for her to mould in with me and us to understand each other. I don't use all the words he used because it just got... I, I worked out if you learnt a word every two days, it wasn't that complicated. Okay. Um, but then I send her on a get on um, instead of, I think it's Eloa, Eloa. Um, but she goes on a get on. Um, Ul sit. Um, I've, it's, it's quite handy actually because she has the different commands to the other dogs so she, uh, she separates quite easily when I'm talking as well mm -hmm. um, yeah but in theory you shouldn't have that many words that you need to say to your dog um, and, and work in the, the way that we train is very much with weight distribution body language gaze so that would have played a big part in moving across from Hungarian to English as well wouldn't it yeah, I, um, she hadn't been sent on an arm. She'd been held by the color, collar and sort of launched out for a retrieve. Well, if we do that in a competition, we're out straight away. So yes. <laughs> um, that was that took a little bit to teach her. But mm -hmm. again, where you teach us is that you throw the dummy out as soon as it had gone out, my arm's out, and she just followed my arm uh -huh. with a get on. So that she learned... I, I for the first month she hunted like stink so actually for the first month I just went actually we're not gonna do that I'm just gonna you're gonna learn that I am the best thing in the world and you're gonna want to be with me mm -hmm. and so rather than let her run I tried to form a relationship with her and get a bond and then once we'd started to get that then I sort of let her out mm -hmm. but I remember because she not she didn't know the stop whistle, okay. um, and um, as I'm tapping my finger, she didn't know the stop whistle. And I remember her running and thinking, "Oh my god, now what do I, I can't stop it." Can't. <laughs> um, but she, I don't know. She learned that. But I think it was two days of just. Uh, obviously, it's a bit different when you got on birds, but the initial stop she got really quickly, mm -hmm. and I did that again through play. Um, and actually, different to how I'd normally do it, because I would have put it in earlier, but did it affect her learning to stop? No. So I think you learn some things from that as well. Um, that uh, maybe you don't always need to put that stop in so early. Um, but you're always learning and trying new things, aren't you? And each dog you do differently, and you go, oh, I shouldn't have done that, or I wish I'd done that, or that worked. Um, yes, and... Yeah, she, I don't put the stop whistling until about six months. Yeah. I, I put a really good recall in and a really good state, but I don't start introducing the stop whistle until they're bouncing out of the skin for a retrieve. Yeah, because I think otherwise it can go the other way, isn't it? I think with us as well, with the HPRs, obviously it's, um, it, it's when they're hunting as well. It's quite a useful thing, isn't it? The sit or the stop as well. To, it sits flush, isn't it? Or standing while something goes. It's that. It's a. It's a useful thing in two ways for us. 
Um, but yeah, so that that was. I remember thinking, oh my god, how do I stop it? Um, mm -hmm. But the first month really was done on relationship, and then I went out and um, started doing some tests with her. And I think last summer, Jane's mother half had a um, hip operation, so he wasn't about. Uh -huh. And so I took the dog. I think I took Bo with me, or I know I did. So Bo came with me. I was like, right, come on, and we go out with the dog. And we just went out and did Nushi. Um, and she was my focus for last year, really. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. And you were winning pretty much every week. It was amazing. Yeah, she did really well. She did really well. Yeah. So you won, you won a trophy at the end, didn't you, for the... Yeah. I was trophy actually... for the end of the season? Remind uh, me. I haven't actually photographed her with that yet. So I've just got awarded it. I think it was last month from the Visualer Society, the highest placed visualer in working tests last year. Wow. You know, the um, amount of points she scored. And she, uh, she won a lot last year. Um, and I started entering her. So she went from puppy and started going into novice. Um, and I did it quite slowly with her, though, because we hadn't been together very long. Uh -huh. So, um, but it was time as well. I think by the end as well, they get a bit bored of it and think, ah, you know, in, if you're doing working tests, you can sit around with them for two hours waiting to have a go. Yeah. I and I, we ask a lot of them um, because it's almost like sit down, switch off for two hours. Now get up and be perfect. Do this. Sit back down. Yeah. It, it is. I mean, I, I, I don't really compete now. I used to, but like that, I used to be like, I'd be sitting there waiting for my turn. I'd be going, oh God, I could be doing this. And then you'd have all of these thoughts going around in your head of all the things you could be doing at home and getting done rather than sitting in the sun, baking, waiting for your turn, you know? And um, I'm, yeah. I'm not very patient. I, I, find it really difficult to sit with we for the young dogs as well you ask a lot it's a lot of that's why in class as well when people are oh i want to go and do this i want to do that i don't think they realize but a lot of the things on shoots and things you're asking the dogs actually to be patient and wait mm -hmm. and they can be for a long time um yeah so for her as well it was a big ask because it's switch off don't do anything then get up perform then switch off again um so I think the winter, we went off and did some other training and things and have a break and then come back to it. Um, and she's still, she's, I think she, she too, I think she might have just had a, like, what month are we in? April. Uh, I've lost April. I don't even know what date yeah. is. I mean, if we get a month and the year. Um, so she's still a baby. Uh-huh. And so um, you... At the minute, obviously, nobody's doing anything. I shouldn't have said obviously, because that's a really horrible word that I'm, <laughs> I'm using very much. But nobody's doing much of anything at the minute because we're in lockdown. We might be out of lockdown or almost out of lockdown by the time this goes out, but at the minute, we're still in lockdown. Um, but you run classes and do one ones as well, don't you? Yeah. And I do have to say, Hannah, I've, and I credit the Pegun Dog Instructor, and she well, was training with me for 18 months. And and stunning you, you know it was lots of really interesting deep deep <laughs> conversations with Hannah about pretty much everything you know getting down to the muscles of movement the proprioception system and um going really deep in nutrition and and how because you're very much into nutrition for sport dogs aren't you and tweaking, yeah. tweaking that so um how do you find like your competition work comes together with being an accredited pet gun dog instructor and, and going into the amount of depth that we went into on the course on things like anatomy and physiology and nutrition, uh, sport and dogs. Um, how do you find all of that lot comes together within your teaching? Because you teach groups. I know you've got a group of girls, haven't you? You've got, you've got a ladies' trialing group, which is awesome. Um, and you've got different groups working or you will when we'll go back to work anyway how do you find it all comes together do you just is your head just constantly buzzing when you're teaching or how do you find it um how do i find it that was a lot well, of questions wasn't it sorry i i like <laughs> yes, all the questions pick one and answer it you know <laughs> sorry <laughs> i'm trying to think i think i know i came to you 
because um, for me, teaching is a responsibility. Uh-huh. Um, I've taught, uh, I used to teach kids, actually, not adults. So riding and I used to do, um, funny enough, I didn't teach art at schools. I didn't want to be a teacher um, because of the responsibility of it, because I feel that you can make you can really make someone or break someone being a teacher or being mediocre. And I think, you know, you really want to give something and make a difference to someone's life if you can as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's responsibility to do it right as well. Or for me, it is. That's what I feel. Um, And I used to do voluntary um, lessons for children. So I used to give my time for children to teach them art, to give them something extra. Yeah. That's lovely. um, And I think with you... To do the guns dog stuff, I I felt as a teacher I was missing elements and I needed to understand more. Um, it, it's important because you're taking someone and their dog mm-hmm. um, and the impact you can have on that. Sorry about that, folks. I had a bit of technical difficulty, so we're going to try and scramble back to where we were before the internet went down. So um, hopefully... We won't backtrack too far, but maybe we will. We'll just have to repeat myself, and that's okay. So we were talking about um, you helping out at school. You give free lessons to children in art, and then when you when you were younger, and then you were talking about how teaching is such a big responsibility in relation to you can make or break somebody's motivation to learn and enthusiasm to learn, and then you started talking about doing the accredited pet gun dog instructor. So I'm not letting you get away with that one. <laughs> About me now. What I said was I think I was a pain in the bum. <laughs> you, well, you, no, you weren't actually. You were very, um, you were really thorough. And I don't think a week went by without at least one deep and meaningful question about the dogs and movement and uh, nutrition and... It was good because you kept me on my toes and you made me think about what I was teaching as well. So do you enjoy, I, you enjoy teaching groups or do you prefer one? I do. Um, and I think it was really, you were an important part of that. And I asked you so much and questioned you um, because I wanted to understand you and your thinking um and to understand the pet gun dog as well and if i didn't ask so much i felt i hadn't got the real base for me to understand it for me to teach i needed to fully understand myself um because obviously then if someone's asking or i'm going through something if i don't fully understand it myself then how can i teach it um uh, and that thing of a responsibility for teaching that might just be me but I know through my life, I've spent a long time in education over the years. Um, I did seven years, I think, after I finished school in higher education, probably. Wow. And different courses. And I think it's really, a teacher is so important um, and what they can give you or not give you. Um, and the dog side, yes, it had a very positive effect on me, I think, with my own dogs mm. and understanding my own dogs and me thinking deeper and having more confidence in myself and what I was doing as well. Yeah. Um, and I think looking more into the anatomy and the food side, um, the little tweaks, the understanding, um, how it has really helped me with my own dogs, but also helped me then teaching other people. Um, I teach a lot of women. Um, not deliberately <laughs> um, but uh, I, I love it and also uh, I love it <laughs> love it and also, um, uh, the group dynamics as well as if I'm doing groups I think the dynamics of the group is very important that teamwork as I always say teamwork makes the dream work I think you need that if positive makes positive um, yeah. and building um together as well is so it's about the dogs but it's also about the people and if you get someone i mean we're still all kids we all still like our gold star and our little sticker don't we we do we do we We do do. and that good feeling the same as giving the dogs the reward and the good feeling look as i'm doing my shoulder we as humans even though we're grown up we still look for that good feeling um 
and that helps us learn as well. It does. It does. Years ago, I used to teach a good citizen in the village hall, and I used to give stickers out. I used to actually give, give the guys stickers and they loved it. And they used to put it on their good citizen books. You know, you get, you get the good citizen booklet. And they used to put that little sticker on their good citizen book. And again, when I talk kinesiology as well, I used to give out stickers. I don't do it in the gun dog world. Maybe I should do it uh, with the APGI scheme, give them little stickers. I do use the high fire emojis a lot, which is the same thing as giving them that little sticker, isn't it? But I chose it. I left school at 16. I couldn't wait to leave school and um, left school on the Friday and started work on the bank holiday Monday as a, as a um, working pupil with horses. And uh, I think Mrs. B was, and her daughter Diane Drysdale were amazing, really motivational teachers and really gave me a passion for teaching. And I've been teaching all my life. I started teaching when I was 13. And it is, it's, um, it's just, I, I just, when people get that aha moment, regardless of whether you're teaching, uh, you know, kinesiology, I taught people how to write computer systems at one point when I was 90, I ran a, let me teach you how to write a computer program. You, you know, it's, um, it's that aha moment, isn't it? And just seeing the joy when people get it. And then when they, if you're then teaching instructors and then they go on and teach and you just go, God, this is, this is awesome. You know, my work here has done, it's amazing. Great to see. Yeah, it's a very um, positive thing. And also I think when you see people with dogs and they're struggling or not getting things and then you, people learn differently as well. Um, trying to work out ways where people get stuck. How I think you have to challenge yourself as a teacher. I challenge myself as a teacher. So not only teaching them, but I go back and, assess myself um to if i think that things uh maybe a few people are doing something and not understanding something or someone's particularly getting stuck on something i'll go back and challenge myself as well and look at myself um i think that's really important as well um to better yourself um because we can always improve or learn new things i think an open mind um is a very important thing um not everything is relevant to us, but we should have an open mind to learning. Yeah, definitely. And also reflection as well. Um, yeah. I'm a great believer, as, as you know, all of every home, pretty much every workshop, it was like a reflective essay on the workshop. And um, I'm a great believer in, in reflecting and uh, not looking back and thinking, oh, I wish I'd done this, but looking back and thinking, well, if I'd done this, then that might have happened, or I did a really good job then, or um it's it's about improving your processes isn't it and giving yourself acknowledgement for doing a good job which yeah. we don't do often enough i mean yesterday i got a video from someone that trains with me and she'd been in her garden with her daughter and um they got a vishla and um uh -huh. she'd been struggling uh with um the dog giving her the retrieve because it had done a uh, ball throw for a long time with the family and things and I got a little video and her daughter had videoed it and edited it together and she was in the garden and the retrieve was coming to her hand. She was doing this. Wow. And I was I was going, yes, as I was watching it and then <laughs> smiling and then going through the movements and then, ah, she's got it, she's got it. And, and that gives me my gold sticker as well, doesn't it? And it's that joy of seeing her enjoy it and understand um, what I've been teaching her and then putting it together and then them going out and doing it. And um she wasn't into the gun dog side she just wanted to do something with her pet dog and then has got into it and enjoys it and also the family does it and it's just great and um those little moments yeah it, it makes me like a kid mm, yeah and the great aren't they? and i think when people get a dog especially a gun dog because um a lot of people aren't really into gun dog training when they bring home a gun dog. They're just bringing home a companion and then quite often they struggle with the temperament of the dog, not realising that they've brought a working dog home, even if it's not necessarily from working lines. At some point that line was bred to work and, and they can struggle and to be given that opportunity to train their pet gun dog. It's why it all came about, you know, to give people 
the opportunity to bond with their dog through training it the way that it's breed intended just it, it transforms the life of the family because all of a sudden they've got a contented dog at home that isn't like trying to eat the furniture or the walls or the children or and it just takes their relationship to the next level and I think as an instructor you feel incredibly privileged to be able to help them do that certainly I do anyway yeah and I think the confidence you see them grow as people um, and confidence with their dog and uh, I think a few weeks ago I mean before this all happened the virus and things I was talking with them saying you know the things I'm teaching you now or the things we're going through now it's not just about now it's it's going to be with you for life but the dogs you go on the knowledge you're getting now I'm trying to hand down things and give to you uh -huh. which will then stay with you for life this will and um how it will move on with your other dogs you know if they have other dogs or what they do it, those skills go on don't they um, and relating um you know there are other jobs like one of um, uh teaches gymnastics to children and was struggling on something so i was saying well think about how you teach your kids with the gymnastics isn't it and relating that across with the dogs and, and pulling those skills out from people as well and um yeah, the, it's the dogs and the people, actually, obviously, that really interest me in the teaching. I think a lot of people go into working with dogs thinking they're going to work with dogs, but it's probably 80% working with the people and 20% playing with dogs. It's, it's having that lovely relationship with people and motivating people to get motivated to go and train their dogs. Or that, that for me, is um, it's pretty much all about the people. Yeah, I, I, I think that's key really you've got to um, understand them and like I say the different ways of teaching but also going back to you the skills you gave me of understanding the dogs more um, has helped that as well um, and my confidence and also always having you in the background somewhere as well is um... <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yes always in the background always there <laughs> hanging around waiting <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? it can be quite lonely as a teacher as well um you know and having someone else or our groups to go back to or talk to is, is nice as well I mean if I was honest one of the things I miss sometimes when I'm with my lot is sometimes I'll stand there and think oh, I wish I was out with my dog doing this today with a teacher yes you know I, I, I miss that I miss that I there, there was and it sounds it, it, it almost sounds quite um I don't even know the word, arrogant, but, you, you know, without the false modesty, sometimes I would be teaching a class and I'd be thinking, oh, God, I wish I was in this class and not teaching it because everybody would look as if they're having such good fun. And you think, well, can I not have a mate to go and teach, to go and train my dogs with, you know? Yeah, I, I think because that's, what got, got, that's what's got us all started in it. And um, I still go off sometimes and see specific people or friends or um, go off on the odd training thing because I need that as well for myself and my dogs because that was my escape time. If you, if you Like the people, you know, often when they come, that's their slot, their time away from everything with their dog. Yeah. And although we often go out on our own, it's nice to have that interaction with people as well. Mm, it is, definitely. It is. Um, I'm a bit, I mean, going back to the working test and things, I think, um and the bits that go on with the hpr so that's probably why i like it as well because i like i mean there is a social side and they're a nice group of people as well and, and that side is nice with the dogs as well everyone coming together which is you've all got a similar interest um yeah very positive as well that's brilliant so this year um it looks like all of <laughs> well, this year has just been cancelled hasn't it it's just been cancelled so but next year, you're going to be competing again with Nushi? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I was hoping I was going to trial it this year, but it's just not all gone. To, and I think that's where you've got to be relaxed about stuff as well and things flow, don't they? Um, Ziva, I've got to do Ziva. I need to, because I left Ziva a bit last year, so I've got a little Ziva as well I need to bring back in and do some stuff with. Um, in the winter, I spend most of my winter working my dogs anyway, so half my week... I spend on a shoot working the dogs and I have done, I mean, when I was a single parent, 
that's what I did for my money in the winter and the shoot locally has always been very good to me and I keep that my hand in there because uh -huh. um, I enjoy it again it's a group of people I've been with a long time I love that side of just taking my dogs out and working them mm -hmm. uh, so I mean this winter who knows what's going to happen well there's a lot of shoots closing which is yeah. heartbreaking um, so many closing down now so I think this year it'll be what it is isn't it um and then next year yeah. i think this happens. year we just have to adapt and go with the floor don't we yeah i or don't can do. yeah and and stuff happens you, like you said you're busy i'm busy we've got other stuff doing isn't it? i'm still keeping in touch with clients and setting little things for them to do um uh, and uh, yeah i i who knows who knows <laughs> who knows Hannah, it has been absolutely brilliant talking to you. I just, um, I'm going to go with myself and have a cup of coffee actually because I was drinking my coffee and I was thinking, no, I'm probably slurping into the mic. So <laughs> I have it. it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been great having a coffee with you uh, over the podcast. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, thank you. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And good luck uh, with your dogs getting ready for Craigie. It'll be next year's. Uh, working test season and yeah. have an amazing shooting season when it comes around yeah thank you take care bye. thank bye. you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.